help to make her feel isolated and, and alone in, the, in her fall. Um, so I, I just, <coughs> you know, exaggerated the, <coughs> the docs down there, corrected the, um, uh, what's the word, the contrast, because it, it, there is like, it was still too contrasty because in the, in the process of the light bouncing from a distance towards the camera on your eyes or your eyes, uh, the light not only scatter in the shadow to to obscure, ob obfuscate the details in shadows and, and lighten the shadows, it also tends to lose a bit of its energy because obviously if a light ray coming to you is bouncing around in the atmosphere, it won't reach your eyes. So it means that the total amount of energy that is bouncing from this surface toward your eyes is going to be a bit um, less powerful when it reaches you and it translates into less light that comes to you because this light is bouncing around in the atmosphere. So generally with atmospheric perspective comes not only a lighting of the shadow part but also a slight decrease in, uh, in contrast and in overall uh, value. So this is a mistake I see often, uh, beginners do, they tend to blow the light uh, with the distance, which is not what is happening in the real world. In the real world, objects in distance, even the light, very, very light objects, uh, maybe apart from objects reflecting directly the, the sun, because they will still send a huge amount of energy, but other objects, even white objects, they will tend to lose a bit of their value in the light side when they reach you. So I believe this is mostly what the, the changes I did at the uh, atmospheric depth. So I probably did a few changes at the local colors too, as you can see. So uh, I exaggerated the, um, let me remove everything so you can see at the local colors. I started to remove also a lot with um, a depth mask here. I started to remove a lot of the local contrast because I don't need this contrast. And this is something that is difficult to achieve at the, at the depth uh, folder alone. So I'm trying to do it also at the local colors folder and I try to, to decrease the uh, contrast in the local texture of objects. You know, it's a simple luminosity layer and basically you see I just totally reduced the uh, range of values. So this way it allows to, to really simulate a better blending change, sorry. Depths. If I, I'm adding only my depths, you can see that it really already helped to convey a sense of depth with distance where local colors, they start to simplify toward a flat color. And on top of that, if I'm adding my lighting information, you know, this works in the background, they start to feel really, really far away because not only their shadow parts start to be occluded and doesn't have any details, the brightest side, which is into the light, send much less energy than objects that are to closer to us. And last, the local contrast uh, of the object itself start to move toward um, a flat color. So all these elements help to create a, really, a real sense of, of depth. So at the mood layer, I see I, I've added a, a couple corrections. So right now the sky is uh, way too right, but I believe this is something I fixed later in the process. And 
When I start to separate my elements one from another, I generally add that on top of my depth layer because the thing is my depth map layer folder, my depth folder, it contains a map with very defined edges. So I can't add my separation underneath this layer because it's going to, it's going to, um, the, the depth is going to mess with the layers. So since my depth maps is going, is, is destroying all this work. So I'm adding my separation on top of my depth. So here it's just mostly like simple, very simple layer, normal layer, a light on layer. I don't even know what it is doing. Uh, sometimes I have, oh, okay, it's for the rabbit. So it's almost imperceptible. It's very, very, very slight adjustment. But this very slight adjustment are what makes the difference at the end. So I really wanted to push this rabbit down into the distance to really make it feel way bigger than she is. And it, it is way bigger, but I just, because there is no overlap in composition right now, there is no element overlapping that helps to decide whether she is in front or just near him. The same thing for those elements. So um, repetition in composition help to help the audience to understand the principle of scale. So here there is a lot of repetition. We see this balloon here in big with the guys in here. We can more or less understand that because they seem to, to have a normal scale, they probably have the same scale than her. So this gives a first indication of scale. Then this one is way smaller and this one smaller. So we understand based on the principle of repetition of shape, of identical shape, then this one is farther in space. But this is not enough to give an information about the rabbit. So this is why slowly I started to build up more separation. So in this layer, I'm working on separating shapes with broad uh, gradients of values. You know, the shoulder in here and starting to help in separating the main character from the background with a reduction of contrast mainly and darkening of the values. And then the clouds are the, the, really the, the key to creating a layering of elements that now will help to understand that the rabbit is farther in space, thanks to this final piece, right? Because now this one gives us an indication of scale. Yeah, so we, we can understand that this balloon is farther in space than the character and then this one even further. And now this one, it is on top of this layer of cloud. Yeah, and we can understand because there is continuity that this layer of cloud is, is like at the same, at the same uh, level. And now this cloud is going on top of the rabbit. So there is no confusion. We now understand that this rabbit is very far in space and it's like much, much, much bigger than, than Alice. So paint over, I have like my paint over underneath my, my depth. So this is, this is mostly simulating the uh, subsurface scattering that is occurring in the fabric elements. And a slight correction of value for Alice. And now my paint over on top of everything. And next stage, I will flatten all these elements. So the color code I'm using in here, uh, generally these are the color code I start to use for myself when my, my file, file start to become uh, very, very complex. So I don't necessarily add all of these uh, color codes, but generally I have the gray for the separation 
and I have a couple other color code I use. So this helped me to quickly go through my file and find the, uh, the, the elements I'm looking for. So here, this is when I've been actually flattening the file. Just let me clean what we don't need. Okay. So what I did instead, I flattened my file up to the depth pass to the depth folder. So this way I was, I was okay with the depth and at any point, if I don't know all the students, I'm noticing that I made a big mistake at, with my, uh, with the flattening, I can go back to the previous version of the file and quickly get another copy merge version of, of, uh, of the file and just, uh, correct with, with, uh, painting in a mask, you know, <clears throat> so it's, it's quite easy to, to fix. Okay. And from here, now I try to keep things organized with my, my mood folder on top of everything <coughs> and my Another, another version of the depth. So now I've been creating another folder called depth, but what I did basically is just to continue to push the depth further than what I did before. But I was quite, I was kind of okay with this as a base to work with. So this is why I flattened it. And now I have a much smaller file, which is more manageable and, you know, easier to make corrections. So. Once again, paint over and my separator, which is here. So just did a couple change based on the, on the last one. And no, it's not the correct one. It was this one. You know, fix, fixed a bit of the, light, the lighting in the clouds. So the clouds, they are just clouds that I painted with a, a cloud brush. And from now on, once I, I start to do that generally, uh, I, as I said, uh, I generally try to keep my mood, at least my mood in separate folder. So sometimes I, I can flatten it, but now I, I'm less, I am less, uh, scared to flatten things because I started to flatten. So I really like this part of the process because this is really when the compositing is finished. I I'm happy. I'm kind of happy with the overall values, colors and mood and so on. So now I'm really starting the painting process, which is really make this to work as a painting. So how does that, does you make an image work as a painting? It's mostly by, by simplifying textures and working on edges. So ju just lose some edges and yeah, do what, what a painter does to, you know, just fix very small things that are in there that doesn't work and so on. So this is a bit later, the version seven. So. I'm going to save that one too. In the and what I do from time to time, I like to do this. I like to drop a, three, a threshold adjustment layer on top of everything to make sure to have another uh, vision of the values of my painting. And if when I'm using this threshold adjustment, I can't understand my image, it often means that something is wrong with the composition. Uh, it doesn't have to be perfect on the understanding, but at least the major elements of the image should read at an abstract level. I mean, if here I wasn't capable of identif identifying any shape, it would mean that my composition had an issue. And another thing I like to do is sometimes just do a quick uh, post-processing pass with Camera Raw, and I'll show you later how to do that. Just to have an idea, I don't see, know if you can see this in the video, but just add a tiny bit of light bloom and of grain, of photographic grain, just to have an idea of how it 
kind of looks like in a finished state to see just to see where I am, you know, in a, in a more or less finished condition. And this one is a bit later in the process. So here you see I still have my layers and here I added an FX layer on top of everything. And I have my clean pass and my paint over. So most what mostly change in here if I can figure it out. Yeah, it's it's this uh, sorry for the noise. Apologies. Okay, so let's clean everything. Okay, so I have my mood in here. I have my depth correction, so we are more or less more or less in the same stage than here. If I'm removing my FX. Okay, so here I just added a bit more clouds and so on. And now I started the paint over process. So this is my favorite stage. So what I do in the paint over process is I'm just taking a brush, mixer brush or the standard brush, and I'm going through the image and I, and I start to really try to work on on my edges and on my textures. So I try to simplify the textures as much as I can. See, just try to lose edges, simplify textures, lose edges, simplify textures. It's a slow process, but it's really enjoyable because at this stage, this is a no brainer. There is like, Almost everything is fixed and not everything if the character here and the skin doesn't work at all. But for the paint over parts, a lot of, a lot of things are already fixed. So this is just a matter of picking colors, painting, picking colors, painting, another paint over layer. So this is before the paint over, after, before, after. These are really slight, very slight changes, but that makes a difference be between an image that can look 3D-ish and, and a bit too sharp and an image that look more painterly. Paint over. So how do, how do I paint over? So I'm going to show you this here. I'm going to pick my clean layer. Let's pretend uh, we are starting from, from here. I use, I use two things for my paint over, two Photoshop tools that you all know. The first is the, is the brush tool with my custom brushes. You no, know, pick, paint, pick, paint. Just to simplify textures and lose edges and bring that degree of painterliness and it's it's a slow process but as i said it's it's really enjoyable because you, you can put up mu some music and uh, stop solving problems and just enjoying so, yeah, the process of painting and yeah i destroyed my file so no problem now, the second way of doing it that I love to, to use is, is using the, um, the mixer brush. So I'm going to, to include a, a lot of these uh, brushes in the tutorial. So the mixer brush, uh, it's kind of a complicated brush at first when you're not used to, but most of the time, what I use is a blending feature of the mixer brush. Yeah, very, very awesome, right? So it's really great because you don't have to pick colors. You just need to brush over your painting. 
but sometimes it's it's a bit complicated to have to not be able to separate the changes you are making on a separate layer right because at some point it's just layer after layer after layer of of a uh, of changes but you can't you can't really go back and identify the part of the of the image that are that are being involved in the changes apart just clicking to see you know but you can make you can't make a selection for example and so on. so what you can do very simple trick you're going to duplicate your your file you take the fill uh, this layer you take the fill of this layer and you put it to one percent very very important okay one percent fill now you now you create um, an empty layer that you are going to place underneath this one percent fit layer and now you're going to merge down the, this third layer okay i'm going back you merge down your one percent fit layer into your empty layer so what it does then what it does is now you can pick your your blender square blender and you can remove this sample all layers and the way the mixer brush works is going to pick the fill part of the layer so if i'm clicking on this layer apparently there is nothing you see i can tell there is nothing but actually there is something there is all the information see that are underneath they are here right so you can now come and brush into this layer and your your blending brush it's going to pick this fill informations to paint and this is honestly an awesome feature really awesome so now i can just go into this, this layer and focus on the micro composition so micro composition is you know de-emphasizing edges where they don't need to be emphasized just to slow down the rhythm of the reading de-emphasize edges simplify textures where, where they don't need to be complex because it, it's it distract from focusing on the interesting part of the image you know add concentrate on adding movement in the image so movement movement through careful texture brushing just to help create an impression of uh, of displacement the emphasize edges if needed at some part of the image i mean it's it's already obvious so there is a shape separation so sometimes you don't need to have such a strong edge because it distracts the eye it creates too strong of a contrast and then your your eyes tend to to want to go where there is a this stronger shape or value or line contrast so by emphasizing edges like that you know it it helps to slow down the rhythm of the reading of the image yeah, no, like for example here there is texture everywhere. It's it's really not interesting. It's not it's not beautiful and uh, it's not needed. This texture here is too strong. So carefully brushing over, pick another brush, you know, simplify simplify textures. And add movement movement in the direction of the center of interest starting to brush suggest suggest movement in the texture itself it's like having an oil paint with a fresh layer of a of paint on top of it and you start to just having fun in blending 
colors, textures, edges. And sometimes you can be more heavy handed if you want to suggest you know, a stronger movement at some, at some place. If a, if a brush doesn't work, you know, just try another one. Well, for example, here it's way, everything is too, too complex in here. So I'm going to pick like, don't know this airy brush and try to simplify all this uh, complex pattern that doesn't bring anything to the story and to the reading. So just want to simplify. Also break edges, you can help to, you know, just break some edges because they look, they look too sharp and, and 3D-ish. Yeah, so this is it. This is how I'm doing it. And depending on the need, sometimes I, I can pick the, the normal brush and start just painting with a flat opaque color that I'm picking up. For example, sometimes I'm, I'm, I'll tell you, oh, okay, this green is it, cool. You know, I, I want to add a bit more of this green here and maybe de emphasize it at some other place. So both brush engine are really interesting because if you only use the mixer brush and you start to be too heavy and dead with it, it's, it starts to I don't know how to explain that. The image will look uh, like a, a, a mushroom. I don't know. It's it's like everything is doesn't have any strength. So it's very important to keep some strong edges and to different de-emphasize other edges. It's it's really a, a, a fine balance of where you want to have your details and when where you want your your audience to look at. And I have some brushes that are more suited to uh, de-emphasize textures and some others that works better for, for edges, depends. And it's only when we, you, you go through and you click just and you start to realize how better it looks when you start to do this work and it's it's a work of patience because it definitely takes time i mean it, it it can take up to a full day for an image like that for me to really do this over painting of our work that is going to uh, fill the gap between a 3d ish color red work and a painting and obviously for, I mean, for concept art and so on, I, I don't spend that much time. I don't, I don't need to, I'm going to, to get rougher, but for cover art and uh, commercials and so on, um, it's important to, I think, to really spend time to do this, to really help to, uh, to make this feel painterly. Well, at least this is what I like. I mean, you don't have to to like that, but for me, it's, it's important. Finalizing. So this is where we were. So I'm going to control A, control my C. Copy past this so we can see the difference. This is the stage before this is now before now you can see nothing much has changed this is, these are really slight slight changes but for me these changes they make all the difference this is really 
the difference between something that that looks 3D-ish and and too sharp and not yet a full-fledged illustration and something that looks painterly and uh, and yeah just finished so for this I'm going to go through this file here so as you can see when I start to uh, do this paint over work I'm flattening everything almost everything I mean I still have my very important layers that I don't want to touch which are the FX the mode and some of the post effects I'm going to show you this but for all the rest I'm flattening so I have my base I, I try to keep an history of my very important states just in case I need to bring back something from a, a, a previous stage so I believe this is more or less this stage here as you can see apart from the fx this is the same stage so after this I have a first stage of paint over so here I did exactly what I shown you before which is just moving around the image, simplify textures, and start to lose edges. So here I started to correct the, the main character, you know, fix, fix some of the skin issues and the, uh, the shape of the feet. You now adding some more details. And continuing to uh, to do this simplification and uh, and edge work. So here I decided to add back some straighter lines at some at some places. Add more details. A little fix here. We can almost not see it. Fixing again. This one I don't even know what it is. It's, yeah, sometimes it's really, really small fix, you know. Just fixing a bit of the over brightness of this red, yeah. Bit of details. The advantage of this stage is because there is layer with very few pixel content, it doesn't take that much place uh, in memory, for, I mean, it doesn't create like these huge files I had before. So here again, a little fix on this fit, on this foot to make it look like more natural. I don't know if it's better, but I think it was, it wasn't very elegant, this very big toe. So I wanted to fix that, you know, small, small fix on, a, on the character again. Here, I don't even know what I did. Sometimes I, I have a layer. So it's, there is something in here, but I don't know why. Let's see. Oh, you can see it's, it's here. Very, very small fix. Yeah, so this is a fix, I believe, on the end. I, I cannot see it. I don't know what it is. So same thing here, what I did it was maybe dissolve. Oh, okay, this is a cool trick. I want to show you this. So the dissolve blend mode, I honestly never managed for a long time to find a decent use for it. And I think like uh, one year and a half ago, I, I found a really cool use. And what I do generally, I make, I make a copy of my image and I'm using, um, what's the name again, a uh, Gaussian Brewer. You know, a small Gaussian Brewer of maybe like four pixels, I don't know, four or five pixels. And then I'm putting this layer on dissolve, right? And when you start to lower the density down, it really does a nice job at breaking edges. 
because on on surfaces it it doesn't change a lot of things it's not super obvious but on edges it it does this interesting job of breaking edges without blurring them too much right and then what i did here is simply go with my round brush and start to slightly de-emphasize some edges. So it's it's very subtle, but as I said, these are these very, very small, subtle steps. I mean, if I just merge everything to see what I have here, all these small steps, it's, they start to, one after another, do something because We'll see afterward what we did. Let me get back to the initial stage to make sure I don't break anything. Okay. Um, very slight, small modification of our. No, we are we are not going to spend too much time. But uh, <clears throat> a slight, a slight post-processing trick I did here is just to copy copy merge my image and use and convert. Uh, I I converted it into um, uh, what's the name again? I forgot it. A smart object. Right, because what is interesting with smart objects is that you can easily add uh, dynamic filters. So if you're not happy with this Gaussian filter, you can come back here and slightly change the, um, the value of the filter. So what I did, I believe, is make a copy merge of my image. I'm going to do it again for you, but basically make a copy merge, change the contrast ratio in order to only get uh, a very contrasty version and information about the lightest part of the image, add a slight blur on top of everything and putting putting it on screen and you know 50% and paint into a mask. So sometimes I, I do more complicated bloom effects, but for this instance, I think it was it was enough. So copy merge. No, get only the informations. Uh, then convert it to. I could even even do that. You know, convert to smart object in the first place. Add blur of maybe like a slight blur of four percent for four pixel. I mean. Then contrast the image and now blur it again. Blur. I believe it was like something like forty percent. Okay, and now I can put it on screen. And it creates this uh, bloom effect pass. And I would advise to be very careful with bloom effect because uh, sometimes moving from no bloom to bloom, it, it's, it looks like super, I don't know, flattering, but it, in general, it, it, it tends to break composition a lot because it, it removes this, the nice separation you've been doing uh, between your shapes. So I think it's something to use with, with a lot of care, you know, just come by hand and brush at some places to suggest the light bloom, but without having it everywhere. Because you don't need you don't need to have it everywhere to to suggest to the brain of the viewer that the light is so strong that the brightest part of the image start to to scatter light start to scatter in the uh, either in the eye or in the lens. Because this is what light bloom is. Light bloom is the dispersion of the highest 
part of the light spectrum that reach either your cornea or either the lens of the camera. And it is so strong that when it, it starts to enter the, the camera or the eye, it starts to scatter around the, uh, the, main, the main shape. So it creates this slight bloom effect, which is really nice, but overused, it's, it's, it's really bad. Okay, so light scattering. Small, small trick, and I saw I did something else here to break the edges. So what I did here, I created an edge map. Very, very interesting to have an edge map for post-processing purposes. So to make an edge map, you go into filter, filter gallery, and you pick this uh, glowing edges filter, right? So you want to adjust this filter so it's not too noisy. So I'm going to increase my, my edge width and maybe decrease my smoothness. No, increase my smoothness a lot. Decrease my edge brightness, my edge width. I don't know. It's a, it's a slight um, balance to find. Okay. And we are going to clean this afterward because it, it's too noisy. Right, so now I'm going to desaturate everything and I'm going to clean this edge map like that. Okay, and now I'm going to blur. I'm going to use a slight Gaussian blur. Doesn't have to be super strong. And the goal is just to be able to create a selection of my edges. So Control A, Control C, and now I have an edge map. So this is what I have in here. And What I did here, I'm trying to figure out because I don't remember. Ah, okay, so I did a slight, I believe this is not, um, yeah, this is not a Gaussian brewer. I think this is a lens brewer here, brewer, lens brewer. So this is a slight lens brewer that I had on top of everything. And I use this, edge map to break, to break a bit more my edges, like that. And on top of it, I've been adding a texture, a painterly texture. Let me show you this texture on overlay mode. It's very, it's very subtle. I don't even know if we can see it, but uh, super subtle texture on top of everything to break a bit of this of this um, this edge blur. Okay, my red peel in is here. So this is this is honestly very very subtle, but it starts to matter in the next step I'm going to show you, which is extremely important. Let me save this. File. And the next stage is the post processing stage. So a trick in Photoshop to create a dynamic post-processing because it's really, it's really, um, when you start to make a series of post-processing steps and then all of a sudden you need to change something underneath the stack. It's, it's really annoying because you have to redo these steps by hand all the time, it's terrible. So what you can do, very, very nice trick is Take your file here, right? You control A, control Maj C to make a copy merge version. Okay. Control in to create a new file from the clipboard. Create control V. Now you are going to click on this file and you are going to convert it into a smart object. 
And now you can reference, if you have one of the later version of Photoshop, otherwise it won't work, but on one of the later version of Photoshop that can cross-reference another file, you can use this relink to file feature. If it's not possible, what you can do otherwise is your, you pick your main file, right? With Control Mage A, you select all of your layers <coughs> and you click on them and you convert them into a smart object. For this to work, you need to have no uh, local layer selected. So you can convert to smart object. I'm not going to do it because there is a lot of layers, but basically it does the exact same thing. The only difference is in this case, let's do it anyway, so you can see what it, what it does. If you convert it into a smart object, <coughs> you layers into your files, then your smart object is going to be embedded into your file. So this is going to increase quite significantly the size of your file. But it works. What I'm going to show works in this instance. Or you can do it the way I'm showing already. It's You're just creating this new file. And now, once you have a, um, a smart object, you can run into file. And now, when you are running into file, you can select the file in question. Let's say I'm selecting down the rabbit hole detailing. Okay. And you're clicking on place. Okay. And now the nice things is that every time you go, you are going to update this file, right? Then detailing anything I do on this file. Now, if I'm saving it, it's going to update this one. So let's say, for example, I'm, I'm doing something super interesting, like this, you know, and if I'm doing control S, it's going to save the file. Sorry for the time it takes. And then it's going to update this one. And now you can see it's updating the smart object. Right? So, let's get back to where I was. I'm going to close this one. Now I showed you how I do it. Remove this layer. Okay. And now I'm going to save this one in the proper folder and I'm going to relink relink to file and I'm going to pick down the rabbit hole 10 detailing. So it's going to create the, the link and it's going to update the uh, post-processing effect. So for this file, my, my post-processing stack is super simple. So let's, let's save this one. So it's going to update this one. There is only <coughs> one camera row effect, which is here. But sometimes it really depends on the file. So there is no, no receipt, but I'm going to show you the, the step I take. Sometimes I have, I have more. More, more, more effects that are added in the post-processing stage. So let's open this just to see what I have. So I have basically a sharpening with luminance and a bit of grain. Okay. So now let's let's say let's pretend I want to separate my grain from my sharpening luminance. So what I did, I, I just copy dragged with control alt drag this, uh, this effect to, 
to replicate it. So I'm going to remove the grain from this one, amount of grain zero. Okay. And on this stage, I'm going to remove the sharpening luminance. And really this post-processing thing is super important because sometimes it really makes a difference before you're exporting your image into GPG, uh, before, uh, between, between, you know, just a, a whip and a, fi a final image. So I don't want any sharpening here and I don't want any luminance. I only want the noise. Right? So now I have two effects, one with the noise and was with one with the sharpening, sharpening and uh, luminance. Now, if I'm, you know, just in clicking this layer, you can see it doesn't, it's not a, a lot, but it does change a few things. I think there is another adjustment somewhere. Yeah, this is the exposure. So I only want to keep the exposure on one of these layers. Okay. So now it means that I can continue to add very, very small uh, adjustments on this uh, dynamic layer. And now each time I'm going to make a modification in here, continue to, you know, continue to, to paint over and just do like small modification at some places. Each time I'm going to save this file it's going to update the uh, post-processing version. And if I don't want it to happen, I can simply close this one, save it, close it, and it won't update. And it will only, only update next time I'm going to open it. it. It's going to ask me if I want to update it. So it's a, it's a, really, it's a really nice way to, to have all of the post-processing effect into one place and and not having to re-update them by hand. So about Camera Row, let's open Camera Row. And uh, it's, it's really an amazing tool. I mean, if you are doing a bit of photography, you, you probably know Camera Row. And if you don't, you should really, because for for image for post image processing, it's really very incre an incredible tool, very very powerful. I mean, you can you can pretty much really tweak anything you want from you know just tweak a bit the contrast and uh, lowering your black. I don't know. A thing I try to be very careful for my images is to make sure that I don't have too much values either in the higher end of the spectrum or in the lower lower end because for images that are meant to be displayed on screens you have to be careful about the screens that are that tends to crush values in the in the uh, extreme of the spectrum i mean most of the of the screen do it even even the the high end screens like iphone screens and ipad screens they don't have a very they don't have a perfectly linear answer. I mean, if you take an ISO as reference, uh, you, you really are going to see uh, the, the difference on this screen. So the best of things to do is just to avoid to have too much uh, values in the very dark and the very bright. This way you are going to make sure that your image is going to display okay on most, on most screens. 
So yeah, camera row, you can, you know, basically tweak your color temperature, fix just very, very small things if you need to add a bit of grain. Luminance is very interesting to just remove a bit of the noise in, in some big flat areas. Uh, you can sharpen, you can obviously sharpen in Photoshop, but I really like the sharpening algorithm in uh, in Camera Raw because you, you have this masking, dynamic masking, and you can add more details if you want. And you can you can trick pretty much any any color and value you want. You can even do a bit of a of lens correction if you want. I generally try to avoid as much as possible to do vignetting. I, I was using it at some point, but I started to realize it, it really makes the image look uh, cheap. But sometimes just a small amount of vignetting can be can be cool. And the grain in Camera Raw, I really like the grain, so I, I try to use this one in general. And you can sometimes you can you can have interesting effect by starting to treat just part of the of the primary colors. It's not something I would advise to do at the very end of, of a process like that, where you you spend so much time to make sure that your colors were working together. But sometimes in, in visual development where you want to work faster, it's it can be an, an interesting thing to discover unexpected color schemes and uh, you know come with like different color gamuts color mask gamut mask sorry okay i'm going to cancel this but this is camera raw. so i believe this is it the last step i'm taking and this is for exporting gpg i'm adding very slight amount of noise on top of everything, you really have to zoom in way, way, way in to see it. But what I found with time is that it helps the GPG export algorithm to get a more interesting grain and avoid some of the uh, artifacts that come with uh, the residual existence of 3D. So sometimes, um, yeah, just fine, it looks better. So this is like noise, add noise. I'm using it only for this. So this is my usual setting, 3.5% of noise. And I'm putting this into overlay like 30, 50%, it, it depends. A quick overall review of the process before finishing. So, start in 3D with simple, very simple shapes, define composition, then start to add more details. And see, the composition is is more or less defined. Focus on the key shot windows to really start to see it as a as the, as the beginning of the painting instead of just a, a 3D render. Just starting to texture underneath the, the light pass, adding atmospheric perspective, starting to get crazy with colors and start to define a more co coherent color schemes and uh, separate elements with by, by painting. Work on atmosphere, even more fix, and painting over, start to blend edges and uh, simplify textures and surfaces. More paint over, and I think <coughs> final uh, final tweaks 
just more edge blending and just a bit of post-processing to, uh, to push it to, uh, to a finished state. So thank you for watching and uh, don't hesitate to reach me if you have any question or have a feedback you want to, to let me know of. You know, you can reach me by email, social media, whatever. Uh, just get in touch and I, I'll do my best to come back to you as soon as I can. Bye.